Hi everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Today we're going to focus on the immune response. So we're going to be looking at your innate and adaptive immunities, as well as how the immune system helps us have the concept of vaccines. Now when we talk about today's immune system, what we need to focus on are those two terms, innate versus adaptive. Now when you hear the word innate in English, what does that mean? If something is innate to you, well, it means you're born with it. Whereas if something is adaptive, you've adapted or changed and developed over time. So whenever you see those two words with immunity, innate immunity will refer to the immune system aspects that you are born with and have throughout your whole life. And adaptive will instead focus on the immunity that you develop the longer that you are alive. We just mentioned it's important to be able to distinguish between innate versus adaptive immunity. And like we said, when you have innate immune responses, these are the immunity aspects that you're born with. Okay, you don't have to do anything extra, and you usually don't even notice that they exist or that they're occurring. Because you're born with them, these are nonspecific and very quick-acting immune responses, meaning that they don't take the time to try and identify and characterize the microbe that's trying to, to infiltrate your body. Instead, they will just target anything and everything that they consider a foreign invader. Okay, so if it's not meant to be in your body, it's not one of your cells, then they will try to block it. Okay, whereas adaptive immunity, this is the immunity that you build over time. And since you're building it over time, this is much more specific and slow, especially the first time it encounters a microbe. Okay, this one we actually notice because we don't get sick twice with the same illness, meaning that we've adapted, that we've developed immunity against it. Okay, so basically in adaptive immunity, it's specific in that this immunity will take the time to identify and characterize exactly what microbe is infecting us, and then it will develop specific antibodies against it and really target that exact threat. It'll then have memory of exactly which microbe that was and how it defeated it, so that if you ever encounter that microbe again down the line, well then you'll have all of this, you know, already prepared immunity ready to target it. Okay, so keep in mind the difference between innate versus adaptive immunity. And we're going to go through all of the exact details of each throughout this lecture. So now this slide is just to give you a general overview of all of the aspects of immunity. So for this first outer light blue square, skin, mucus, and antimicrobials, I want you to write innate immunity. Okay, so this light blue square, skin, mucus, and antimicrobials are all part of your innate immunity. Okay. For inflammation, fever, and phagocytes, I want you to write the word both, okay, both. Inflammation, fever, and phagocytes are part of innate immunity, but also part of adaptive immunity. Then lastly, I want you to write adaptive for humoral and cellular immunity, because humoral and cellular immunity only belong to your adaptive immune system. Now, when we say humoral, every time you hear that term, I want you to think of B cells producing antibodies. Okay, so humoral is B cells and antibodies, whereas cellular immunity is your T cell immune response. Okay, so we're going to go through this all more in detail throughout the next slides, but I want you to be very comfortable with the terminology. Now this slide here is a huge figure with all of the different types of immune cells that you'll encounter throughout our discussion of immunity. These include the innate immune cells, the ones that are 
just for both and then the ones that are only for adaptive immunity. But again, with this kind of a figure, you don't have to memorize any of it or go through the exact details because we're now going to go through the significance of each of these throughout the lecture in our own words. Now, before we get into the details of each aspect of immunity, I do wanna point out, especially for those of you going into the medical field, that if your immune response can help us gauge what kind of infections you have or if there's a problem in your body. Uh, specifically, we look at white blood cell counts. And so if your patient or you have a high white blood cell count, then that's usually associated with bacterial infections. And you have a whole lot of these white blood cells being produced to try and fight that infection. If, however, you have a low white blood cell count, that's usually associated with viral infections, okay, viral infections. So that basically means that if you think about it, when you discuss or learn about viruses, what do you know that they can do to your human cells? They can lyse them, right? The lytic types of infections, they can burst these cells. So if they're going around bursting cells, including your white blood cells, now you're going to have a low white blood cell count. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable knowing if I ask about high white blood cell count, that's usually bacterial, whereas low white blood cell count, that's usually viral. Now we're going to start going into each category of immunity. And so even how we categorize innate versus adaptive, within each of these categories, you have subcategories. So for instance, innate immunity, which we said is that born with it, very general kind of immunity, that can be divided into two categories. So innate immunity can be barriers, okay? Your first line of defense, basically physical, chemical, even microbial, barriers blocking the entry of pathogens, okay? Whereas the second line of defense can be any of the mechanisms that destroy any infectious organisms that break through those initial barriers. So for instance, these would be things like special proteins or immune system cells, okay? So first thing we're gonna go through is each type of barrier that helps with your innate immunity to protect you from various pathogens that are constantly trying to gain entry into your body. The big barrier, the largest organ, which we've mentioned before, is skin. So your skin is actually a part of your immune system. There's the epidermis and the dermis, with the epidermis being that outer portion with tight epithelial cells, whereas the dermis is that inner portion of connective tissues. Okay? Now, keep in mind when we talk about skin, what I want you to know is the fact that it is part of your innate immunity. It's the largest organ, and it doesn't just physically protect you. Okay, because you do picture the physical barrier of your whole body is coated with skin. But it also has various things to help further protect you, such as sweat, oils, hair follicles, all things that we'll mention throughout later slides as well. In addition to skin, you also have that lovely, beautiful mucus, okay? And constantly clearing your throat and going, <clears throat> and you're thinking, oh, that's so annoying and gross, especially when you also have that sniffly nose and you're making all those sounds and whatnot. But mucus is actually there to help you. Mucus is part of your innate immunity because it can trap microbes, okay? So you'll have mucous membranes lining the various tracts that have um, very open access to the out outer world. Okay, so things like your nasal, oral, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts will all usually have some sort of lining of mucus. 
And this mucus that they're all producing is very beneficial to you because like I said, it helps trap the microbes. And then what do you do? <coughs> you're, you're shooting it out, right? A cough, you're shooting it out, blowing your nose, you're shooting out this trapped mucus. Okay, so basically mucus allows you to trap microbes that you can then throw out of your body to prevent them from entering fully. The next one is the ciliary escalator. Now this one is constantly helping you, but unlike skin and mucus, you probably haven't really heard this in your everyday life. Um, your ciliary escalator is basically covering your bronchi, your bronchioles, your nose, the, the, the upper portion of your respiratory tract. And the purpose of the ciliary escalator, if you think about what ciliary means or cilia, these are those little hair-like extensions that we've looked at previously. So over here, you see all these cilia, cilia here, look like little hairs floating in the wind, basically. And so what your ciliary escalator does is it uses those cilia to help push up and out that mucus. Because remember, we said mucus's job is to trap the microbes, but then you need a way to get it shot out of your body, okay? Because you don't want to trap them and keep them in your body. You want to trap them and shoot them out of your body, okay? So what the ciliary escalator does is it uses those little hair-like extensions to then push out the mucus and those microbes. Now, unfortunately, in some illnesses, this ciliary escalator is destroyed. And the one that I want you to remember, in what illness caused by pertussis is this ciliary escalator destroyed? That would be whooping cough. And the reason why the people have that persistent whooping cough when they have that infection is because they no longer have the cilia to help push the mucus out. So just picture this mucus stuck in your respiratory tract without a way for you to <coughs> cough it out, right? So with that, whenever you hear ciliary escalator, I want you to think of pertussis destroying that, causing whooping cough. Okay, we'll learn more about that in another lecture, how it's producing toxins that basically break down those cilia. But just think of ciliary escalator as a very important way to get mucus out of your respiratory tract. Next up, we have the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is another barrier of your innate immunity. This is basically a flap at the back of your throat that protects your respiratory tract, okay? So it tries to stay closed to prevent microbes from entering your respiratory tract. Now, this epiglottis is why you should never talk while you're eating, not just because it's totally gross, but also because of the fact that if you speak while you're eating, the vibrations of your larynx will open that flap up and what's gonna happen? Food's gonna go into your respiratory tract and then you will cough and you can even choke if it's a big enough piece of food because there's nothing that's supposed to be going into your respiratory tract except for air. So always be careful never to talk while eating because you don't want any trouble with your epiglottis. Now, all of the ones we've been mentioning so far have been focusing on physical mechanical barriers. But like I said earlier, you can also have chemical protection as well as part of your innate immunity. So the lacrimal apparatus is a great example of one of the innate immunity barriers that's both physical and chemical. And whenever you hear lacrimal apparatus, remember, this is just a fancy way of saying your tears, crying, right? So your tears are actually part of your innate immunity. They're part of your immune system. And anything that is liquid that we talk about today, the first benefit to that is that it can physically flush out wherever it is, meaning it can physically wash away some of the microbes. 
On top of that, it also has chemical aspects in that tears contain the three following enzymes. And please be aware, any of the enzymes we mentioned today, you have to know their exact function. Okay, so tears contain IgA, lysozyme, and lipocalin. IgA, what you can do is you can underline the A. Okay, underline that A and then write the word attachment blocker. Okay, so you can underline the A of attachment because IgA blocks microbe attachment and neutralizes toxins. Okay, and you're going to see this present in a couple of different parts of the immune system today. There's also lysozyme, and what lysozyme does is it destroys peptidoglycan, and as you know, peptidoglycan, crucial for bacterial cells. That's their cell wall, okay? So if you're destroying peptidoglycan, you're destroying the cell wall of these bacteria, and that will kill them. There's also lipocalin. And for lipocalin, I want you to underline the eyes, okay? Underline the eyes and lipocalin because lipocalin binds iron, okay? Binds iron and inhibits pathogens that way because as you know, iron and any of the metals or minerals, what are they for? They're cofactors and cofactors activate enzymes. So if your tears destroy or bind the iron, then the pathogens can't perform their enzymatic functions. They can't do anything with their metabolism and that'll kill them, okay? So for tears, remember IgA blocks microbial attachment, lysozyme will destroy peptidoglycan, and lipocalin will bind iron and inhibit the pathogen that way, okay? So just remember, anytime you make someone cry, you're actually doing them a favor, okay? Just like I like to remember during finals week. <laughs> okay, so just to recap the notes, just in case you missed any of the definitions I just gave, here's a slide for you to pause and jot down your notes. Okay, so similar to tears, saliva also serves a very important role in your innate immunity. So saliva, first of all, because it's liquid-based, it can flush away or wash away microbes, okay? So that was the physical aspect. But again, saliva, just like tears, also contains various enzymes. And remember, make sure you know which enzymes tears contain and what they do, and then which enzymes saliva contains and what they do. So two of these enzymes should look familiar. Okay, we just mentioned lysozyme, which destroys pepti peptidoglycan, so it breaks down bacterial cell walls to help kill. And then IgA, which blocks microbial attachment. And that's very important because as you know, in order to be a pathogen, bacteria or microbes have to stay in your body. They have to be able to attach. So if IgA blocks that attachment, then it helps protect you, and then you could help get rid of that microbe. The last one is histatin, and I want you to put little stars next to that one. It's important because so far we keep mentioning bacteria, but histatin is an antifungal. That's why you usually don't have as many fungal infections in your mouth. Even though it is possible, they're not as common as they would be, okay? So always keep in mind saliva is valuable for its physical washing away characteristics, but also the various enzymes it contains. So again, here's another recap slide for you to pause and write down any information that you just missed. Now, continuing on with the innate immunity barriers, along the lines of when we talked about skin, there's sebum and perspiration. Sebum is a fancy word for oils on your skin, okay? That oily waxiness that you get on your skin. So sebum is a very protective film, okay? Because if you think about it, it's physically blocking some microbes but it's also inhibitory to microbial growth because it lowers the pH of your skin. So it lowers the pH to about three to five, which many microbes don't like. They prefer a nice neutral pH of seven. 
Perspiration is another very important barrier on your skin because perspiration, which is a fancy word for sweat, is one of the liquids that we mentioned can flush or wash away microbes, but it also has lysozyme that we keep mentioning. And anytime you hear lysozyme, remember it breaks down or destroys cell walls by destroying peptidoglycan. Lastly, if you think of perspiration, if you've ever gotten any perspiration or sweat in your eyes or in your mouth, then you're aware that it has a very salty, acidic nature to it. And as we've discussed with microbes, they're very particular about the environment that they're in. So if it's high salt, then they're not going to like it unless they're halophiles. Okay, so high salt would kill them if they're not halophiles. Acidic would kill them if they're not acidophiles. So these qualities of perspiration helps reduce the types of microbes that can inhabit areas of your skin. And so picture if a microbe's trying to attack you and it encounters this sweat, the sweat will help to kill it or to make it uncomfortable and want to leave. Here we list out some more barriers because honestly, we could go on for days and days talking about all these different barriers. But to start wrapping up our innate immunity barriers, here's a listing of some other secretions and juices that help to protect you without you even realizing it. The first one here is gastric juices, which as you can see, look at that low pH. Anytime you see a very low pH or a very high pH, that tells you that it helps kills off any microbes that can't tolerate that kind of environment. Urine and vaginal secretions also add to that concept of pHs that are unfavorable to microbes. Furthermore, since they're liquid and their secretions and they're moving and flowing, they help to physically remove microbes from your body. The next one on the list is transferrins, and transferrins bind iron, which as we've already mentioned, iron is an important cofactor for microbes to be able to perform their metabolic reactions. So if the transferrins bind the iron, then the microbes can't perform their metabolic reactions and they die. You then have earwax listed on here, which we have this lovely picture here of earwax. And earwax, as gross as you may think it is, or as uncomfortable and annoying as it can be when you get quite the blockage in there, earwax is a very valuable barrier because it's very sticky and traps microbes in it. Okay, so it prevents them from getting any deeper in your body. The last two bullet points here are peristalsis and vomiting, as well as defecation and diarrhea. So I know for most people, when they hear things like vomiting and diarrhea, they think, oh, gross, I don't want that. That's horrible. But in actuality, when you end up with vomiting or diarrhea, it's trying to help you. OK, so it's kind of like the memes with good guy vomit or good guy diarrhea. You know, it's, it's labeled as the bad guy, but it's actually trying to do you good. So if you think about it, if you have these vomiting or diarrhea cases, your body is trying to remove the microbes or any toxins that have entered. Okay, so they're trying to get rid of it for you. And peristalsis is along those lines. Peristalsis is that rhythmic contractions to help get the food up and out or any, sorry, any kind of um, microbes up and out. So with this, you have these kinds of movements to try and remove microbes. So I know students laugh when I phrase it this way, but a little vomiting, a little diarrhea, it's actually a good thing. Okay, So don't be quick to take medication when you vomit or have diarrhea once or twice. It's when it's more than a couple of times at once that it becomes a problem. Why is that? Dehydration becomes a danger. Okay, so once or twice vomit or diarrhea is okay. It's trying to help you. It get, gets rid of the, the bad stuff. And honestly, sometimes you'll notice you feel a little better right after. But if it continues or persists more than twice, then you want to try and think about taking medication or hydrating and drinking electrolytes, okay? Because the idea of dehydration can be very problematic. Now, the next thing here is just to remind you 
that your normal flora are also part of your innate immune system, okay? Because barriers can be physical, like skin, chemical, like the enzymes in tears or in saliva, or microbial, like your normal flora, because these guys are trying to be your first line of defense, okay? By having these microbes on your skin or in your gut or wherever they are in your body, they're blocking potential pathogens, right? Because they're taking up space. They're using resources. They're taking up whatever food is there. So no pathogens, potential pathogens in the area can flourish because all of that space and resources are already taken up. Okay, and again, that we specifically call microbial antagonism. Okay, and as this kind of figure helps show, there's a variety of good and bad bacteria that you can encounter, okay, throughout. And I just want to remind you that time and place matters when it comes to normal flora. If they end up in the wrong place or if it's the wrong time, such as your immunocompromise, they can become a problem. But normally, they're there to help. They are part of your immune system. Now for innate immunity, we mentioned that there's the first line of defense, which is all the barriers we just talked about. But there's also that second line of defense. And the second line of defense are the molecules and cells that help to try and destroy any pathogens coming your way, okay? Again, these are general, nonspecific, so it doesn't matter which microbe comes around. They won't bother identifying, they'll just target it. Um, because it's innate immunity. The examples of molecules in innate immunity as the second line of defense are toll-like receptors as well as cytokines. And the cytokines that you see listed there, uh, if you think about cytokines, picture them as chemicals involved in any of your immune responses. And chemokines or type of cytokines in early reactions, and these guys will attract defense cells to the site of infection and help destroy the pathogens. Okay, and as you can kind of see from these diagrams, uh, toll like receptors are molecules on cellular membranes, and these can help determine that a pathogen is present and help to kind of instigate an immune response. And here you see cytokines are secreted chemicals that help to uh, either target pathogens or bring about an immune response. But you don't have to know any of the pathways or signaling involved in this. Just know that both of these are part of the innate immune system. In addition to those molecules, the second line of defense in innate immunity also has various white blood cells. It includes neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, monocytes, dendritic cells, mast cells, and natural killer cells. Now keep in mind that the number of these leukocytes in your patient's blood will directly correlate with the stage of disease. And remember we mentioned that white blood cell counts can help us determine whether an infection is bacterial or viral. Okay, how high have they gone? How low have they gone? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each of these types of cells individually and see what exactly they do for us during immunity. So the first three cells we're gonna look at are neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. And with these guys, you'll notice that a lot of the immune system cells that we talk about will have the term phagocytic written with them. Okay, so many of the white blood cells are phagocytic, meaning that they can engulf and destroy any of the bacterial or um, microbial cells that they encounter. Now, the one that I want you to put little stars next to are the basophils. Basophils are one of two types of immune cells that are going to be releasing histamine. And histamine, I want you to circle, star, highlight that term. Histamine is very important to remember. What this does is it's a vasodilator. Okay, it's a vasodilator, meaning that it promotes blood flow. 
So that's basically very valuable in immune reactions because you want white cell, white blood cells, as many as possible, getting to the infection site. So by increasing blood flow uh, and, and volume, you're now going to be able to have more white blood cells in the area. So histamine is very important. And the fact that basophils release histamine, where do you usually hear about histamine? Allergies, right? You take an antihistamine. Okay, so basophils are going to be one of the two immune cells that are heavily active in allergies. The other one are mast cells that we'll see on the next slide. So next to basophils, I want you to write allergies because you'll see them heavily involved in allergies. The last thing I want you to note on this slide is eosinophils. You'll notice that a lot of times we focus so much on bacterial infections, but eosinophils show that they are the primary defense in parasitic and helminth infections. Okay, they help produce enzymes that are toxic to these organisms. So whenever you see the word helminths, what are you supposed to think of? What does that mean? Helminths are worms. Okay, so eosinophils, if you ever have a worm infection, eosinophils are going to be highly active. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with remembering that basophils will be highly active in allergies and they'll be releasing histamine, a vasodilator, whereas eosinophils will be highly active in parasitic or worm infections. The other cells that are part of innate immunity are monocytes, dendritic cells, mast cells, and natural killer cells. So mono monocytes, you notice, differentiate into macrophages. And macrophages are the most phagocytic of all white blood cells. And they're going to be one of the three antigen-presenting cells that we talk about when we talk about adaptive immunity. Okay? Dendritic cells will also be antigen-presenting cells when we talk about immunity. Okay? Then you notice mast cells. And mast cells, it points out that they produce various chemical mediators and help recruit other cells and influence adaptive immunity. So mast cells, there are a couple of things I want to point out about them. First off, I want you to put a star next to mast cells over here in your notes and write allergies. So remember, basophils and mast cells are highly active in allergies. Now your mast cells, when we say that they produce chemical mediators, what we mean is they produce histamine, heparin, and chymase. So as we just mentioned, histamine is an important vasodilator. And then heparin, I'm sure many of you have heard this either in the clinical sense of where you're working or in your own lives if you've ever had um, anyone who's elderly tends to be on things like heparin, which is an anticoagulant. So similar to the idea of histamine, when we say heparin and we say that it's an anticoagulant, well, that's to increase blood flow, right? Get rid of any clots to increase the blood flow, thin it out, which again is very important to have more blood means more white blood cells present at the site of infection. The last one out of the three chemical mediators is chymase, and chymase is a serine protease. And what that means is it will break down some of the uh, microbes, enzymes, or proteins, which helps destroy the pathogens. The last one on the list here in terms of innate immunity cells are natural killer cells, and that is that guy over here. And so natural killer cells, they do various things, but the things that we like to emphasize with them is that they're able to kill tumor cells and pathogen infected host cells. So basically what they do is they produce enzymes or proteins that are cytotoxic. And remember cyto means cell, so cytotoxic means toxic to cells. So basically if any of your host cells are too badly infected, then they'll make sure to destroy them so that the pathogens don't get a chance to keep 
further infecting or destroying your other cells. Okay, and they can also help destroy or be toxic to tumor cells as well. Okay, now keep in mind some of these cells you will also see in adaptive immunity, but right now we're focusing on innate immunity still. So it's general and not specifically identifying the pathogens involved. So now when we talk about innate immunity and all of those cells and whatnot, you have to ask yourself, how exactly is this innate immunity protecting us? Okay, and there are five mechanisms of innate immunity, which you can remember as PIFK. Okay, they are phagocytosis, inflammation, fever, complement system, and interferon. So make sure you're comfortable knowing these five mechanisms and exactly how they're trying to protect you. So now we're going to go through the stages of phagocytosis. And with phagocytosis, I'm sure you've all heard of it referred to as cell eating. So in order to understand the stages or to help you to remember them, I always like to think of it as well, what do you have to do when you're going to eat? Okay, so now you're the white blood cell, the phagocyte that has to eat. Well, the first thing you have to do is go to the kitchen, right? You have to make your way to the kitchen. You have to make your way to the kitchen and identify the food you're going to eat. So that's what the white blood cell or the phagocyte has to do. It has to undergo chemotaxis. And you can picture it in chemotaxis, you have the word taxis. So picture that as taxis bringing the phagocyte to its food, right? So in this case, it uses cytokines to signal the phagocyte to the exact site of the infection, where the pathogens are. Once you've gotten to where your food is, you then have to grab a hold of it, right? So picture if you're going to eat an apple, you have to grab a hold of that apple before you take a bite out of it. So in that step, for phagocytes, it's called adherence. They have to use their surface receptors to bind to the pathogen's receptors and grab a hold of that pathogen. Then it's time to take a bite and engulf, okay, as we would with our apple. So in that case, they have to ingest the pathogen. And for that, they use little pseudopods. So pseudopods are basically fake hands or fake, fake feet. In this case, they would be like fake hands, throwing that food into their mouth. Once you have the food in your mouth, you then have to start digesting it and chewing it up and breaking it down. So in the case of phagocytes, their digestion is a whole bunch of enzymes that help break down that pathogen. And what they do is when they break down that pathogen, just like when we break down our food, they scavenge or grab a hold of any of the nutrients or parts that they can use, and then they excrete out the rest. Okay, so excretion is simply exocytosis, okay, exo being outside. So they get rid of all of the debris pushed to their surface and shot out into the environment, but they make sure to keep a hold of any of the materials that they can actually use. So to help you visualize this, we have a picture on the next slide. So this picture here is a nice big macrophage, a phagocytic cell. And what you'll notice is it has found its food source, so it had chemotaxis to taxi over to that food source, and it has now grabbed a hold or adhered to that bacterial cell, and it ingests, ingests it. So it ingests it looking like uh, it's throwing it right into its little mouth, if it had a mouth. Once it has ingested it or taken it in, it then has a series of enzymes from usually from what they call their lysosome. And those enzymes will help them to break down this bacteria into tiny little bits. But now notice what they will do is they will keep some of those little bits, some of the proteins, because they'll be able to use that, especially if they're an antigen presenting cell, which we'll see a little later. So they'll keep what they can and then they excrete out the rest. So this is basically the cell eating and that's their version of pooping it right out. Okay, so all of that makes up phagocytosis. 
So in addition to phagocytosis, innate immunity also involves inflammation, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with in one way or another. And what inflammation is, the four signs that it involves are redness, swelling, pain, and heat. And the reason that this is occurring is because there's a change in the blood vessels, basically vasodilation. Now, vasodilation is something that we keep mentioning throughout immunity. And again, the big benefit for vasodilation, if you are widening the blood vessels, then you're increasing the volume and amount of blood that you have there. And so by increasing the blood flow, you now have more white blood cells able to be present at the area of infection. Okay, so vasodilation is very valuable in terms of the immune response. And overall inflammation, if you think about it, it helps destroy the pathogens or at least limit the effects of the pathogens by really increasing the immune response. The next aspect of innate immunity is fever. And again, this is something you're all familiar with, but you may not have ever really thought about why fever is so valuable. So what the fever is, is as we saw in previous lecture, the hypothalamus normally has 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 37 degrees Celsius. And then what we saw previously was that cytokines can trigger a change in prostaglandin levels and thus basically change that thermostat. And when you think about fever, even though you may feel absolutely horrible when you have a fever, ultimately it's actually a very valuable thing for you. So I always ask students to think about what are some of the reasons fever is so beneficial. And I like to have them list at least three reasons. So thinking about your body and if there's an infection, so there's currently pathogens in your body at that moment, and you now have a much higher temperature in there. Well, why is that good? First off, it's gonna inhibit the bacterial growth because as we talked about previously, you know, bacteria are very specific about what environment they like. And so if suddenly it's a lot warmer than they like, you're now inhibiting their growth. Secondly, it can inactivate some bacterial toxins because higher temperatures can denature some of these toxins. Okay, so you're making the, the conditions unfavorable for the bacteria, so you're inhibiting their growth. You're destroying some of their toxins. And if you remember in chemistry classes, Increased heat means increased rate of reactions. So now you're increasing the speed of reactions in the host, which means that you can increase the defenses of that host, okay? Plus, if you think about when you have a fever versus when you have an infection like a cold where there's no fever, if you have something like a cold, you're still running around, trying to go to work, trying to go to school. When you have a fever, what does it do? It forces you to rest, okay? Usually you don't go out and about when your body spikes a fever, okay? So whenever you think of at least three reasons, think of the unfavorable environment that's inhibiting bacterial growth, think of denaturing bacterial toxins, think of increasing the, the speed of reactions in the host, and think of keeping the host resting. Now, even though everyone's heard of things like phagocytosis and inflammation and fever, the last two aspects of the innate immune system, most people don't hear about. The first one here is the complement system, which is basically a series of proteins that are produced by the liver and these proteins help destroy pathogens and increase the immune response. They basically help trigger phagocytosis and inflammation. But what I really want you to think of whenever you hear complement system, think of proteins drilling holes in bacterial cells. 
Okay, so they are destroying pathogens. So they're not as nice as it sounds when you hear a compliment. Okay, they're drilling a hole right through that bacteria. The last of the mechanisms of innate immunity is interferon. And interferon, as soon as you hear that term, I want you to think preventing viruses. Okay, so this is interferon is against viral infections, whereas the other ones we talked about were a little bit more bacterial or any type of infection. So what interferon is, is they're a type of protein that ends up degrading viral mRNA, okay, because it activates various antiviral proteins, okay? So when you think of interferon, think of it as a mechanism against viruses that triggers the degradation of viral mRNA, okay? So now that was all innate immunity, which is the one that you're born with, which is general and just trying to protect you from any and all microbes. Now we have adaptive immunity, okay? For adaptive immunity, there's a few things you have to think about. First of all, this is something that is changing throughout your life. You're constantly acquiring new aspects of adaptive immunity. You acquire them through things like infection or vaccination. Now, with adaptive immunity, I want you to remember that this is a specific response, okay? So with adaptive immunity, the exact pathogen has to be identified and then specifically targeted. So this reaction is gonna take a bit more time, especially the first time it's occurring. And with that, you have to think about the two main categories. Okay, so with adaptive immunity, we break it down into humoral and cellular immunity. Anytime you hear humoral immunity, I want you to think of B cells and antibodies. And anytime you hear cellular immunity, I want you to think of T cells. So make sure you put stars or circle this part here because it's very important to remember and to distinguish between humoral and cellular immunity. We'll talk about in a minute how those two are actually connected. So now when we talk about adaptive immunity, this slide is just to show you how the uh, adaptive immunity cells are arising. And they're arising from stem cells and bone marrow. We see the dendritic cells and the lymphocytes, and notice that with dendritic cells, it mentions that they mature into antigen-presenting cells. So throughout adaptive immunity, you're going to keep hearing antigen-presenting cells, which there are three of that we'll talk about in a minute. And the reason why antigen-presenting cells are so important in adaptive immunity is because we said that adaptive immunity is specific it has to identify the exact pathogen that's being a problem. And so an antigen presenting cells is exactly how it gets to identify the exact pathogen. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a few slides. Now with adaptive immunity, two big key players in adaptive immunity are the B cells and the T cells. B cells, as you see here, mature in bone marrow, and these are the ones that will differentiate into plasma cells and ultimately produce antibodies. Okay, so that's going to be very important in a little while when we summarize adaptive immunity. Whenever you hear B cells, think producing antibodies. T cells, on the other hand, these mature in the thymus, and there are three main categories that will be involved in adaptive immunity. There's cytotoxic T cells, and whenever you hear cyto, that means cell. So cytotoxic is toxic to cells. These guys will actually kill or destroy not only the pathogens, but also any of the host cells that have been infected, basically to a level that you know there's no turning back from. There's also the helper T cells, which will be responsible for, for activating 
all of the different aspects of adaptive immunity. Lastly, on this list, we have the regulatory T cells, and these are the ones that will basically clean up the mess after the reaction is done. And at this point, you also have to make note that because this is adaptive immunity, which is highly specific and took time and resources to be activated, the body makes sure to preserve some of the cells into memory cells. And this is why you don't get sick twice from the same infection, okay? Because of memory cells, your body now has the already activated immune cells to fight that infection. So it's technically not that you're not getting sick from it again. It's just that now your body doesn't have to delay, okay? It doesn't have to identify and activate this, activate that, do all of these steps. Instead, it's already got the immune cells specific to that infection. So it's able to quickly target it so you don't even notice that you've been infected, okay? Because it targets it before you get to have all of the symptoms, okay? So that's what we mean by not, you know, not really getting sick twice from the same thing. Now, we keep mentioning antigen presentation. And what antigen presenting means is when you think of antigens, I like to think of them as the name, name tags of cells. So they're basically the proteins that are on the outside or surface of a cell that's specific to that cell. Okay? And so if your immune cells detect a, an antigen that's not supposed to be one of their self name tags, then they're gonna to wanna to trigger a response to target it. Now there are three different types of cells within immunity that will grab a hold of surface proteins and display them for your other immune cells. The three types of antigen presenting cells are dendritic, macrophages, and B cells. Okay, dendritic, macrophages, and B cells. The way I remember it is DMV, kind of like sounds like the DMV, okay? So keep, keep making sure that you write down three types of antigen presenting cells are dendritic, macrophages, and B cells. And the way they're able to do this is through special proteins on their surface called MHC, major histocompatibility molecules, they're basically like little hands on their surface that can hold out the pathogen's antigen to then tell the T cells or the other immune cells, hey guys, this is what the bad guy looks like. Go get him. Okay, now the way that they work is if you look at this figure over here, an antigen presenting cell will first engulf, just like phagocytosis, engulf a pathogen and break it down with enzymes. What it'll do before excreting the waste is it will scavenge some of that pathogen's proteins and it will push it to its own surface into those little MHC, major histocompatibility molecule surface receptors. So these are like the antigen presenting cells, little hands over here, holding the fragments of the pathogen. And now any T cell coming by or immune cell coming by will be able to know that this is the protein to look for on cells that need to be attacked or destroyed. Okay, so when we talk about antigen presentation, keep in mind the way that these three types of cells are working is they engulf and break down a pathogen and then hold out some of that pathogen's proteins to the T cells or other immune cells to say, hey, this is the bad guy, go target him. Now, if you were to look up immunity, especially adaptive immunity in textbook or on, on any kind of website, it's crazy complex. There are a ton of different pathways and signaling um, models that you would have to go through various terminology that's highly specific. 
for our purposes in microbiology, you don't need to know every little detail of signaling. So instead, I summarize all the key points that I want you to know on this one slide for adaptive immunity in terms of the actual mechanism. So make sure that you are comfortable explaining this process to someone because that will basically help you to truly know that you understand. If you can explain this whole slide to someone else, then you remember and understand the exact mechanism of adaptive immunity. So basically you'll notice adaptive immunity, like we've said before, we break down into humoral and cellular responses. Okay, and again, humoral, think B cells and antibodies, and cellular, think of those three T cells that we mentioned before. So what happens is, first you have the antigen presenting cells, which again can either be dendritic, macrophages, or B cells. Any one of those guys will then present the pathogen's antigen to the helper T cells. The first thing the helper T cells will do is stimulate B cells to differentiate into plasma cells, and those are the cells that will produce or secrete the antibodies. And in a minute, we'll go over how exactly these antibodies can help in immunity. Now, at the same time that that's occurring, the helper T cells will also activate the cellular side of immunity. Specifically, they will cause naive T cells to differentiate into full-blown cytotoxic T cells. And we already said that cytotoxic means cell toxic. So these are the T cells that will destroy not only pathogen cells, but any of the host's really badly infected cells. The way they do this is through chemicals that will trigger apoptosis, which is a fancy way of saying programmed cell death. Okay, so they will cause these cells to pop, basically. Now, at the end of this, you'll have some of the activated cells differentiating into memory cells. And like I said, these memory cells are the basis of why you can't get sick twice from the same infection. And also, they're the basis of vaccines, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, one other thing to mention is after all of this is said and done, the last thing to happen is the regulatory T cells will now clean up everything that's kind of the mess that has been made. Okay, think of it as their job is now to suppress the immune response now that the infection is done, it's been beaten. Okay, so keep going over this slide to help you reinforce everything that's really occurring in the adaptive response and make note of certain things such as how the helper T cells are involved in both sides of this process. Okay, they, the helper T cells are responsible for activating both sides. Okay, if you have any difficulty or any questions regarding the process, please contact me in the Remind app or through email because I know it can be a lot of uh, information in the immunity chapters sometimes. Okay, so this slide is a figure that kind of summarizes both sides of adaptive immunity, the humoral and the cellular reactions. But like I said, keep in mind any of the figures and whatnot that you find will usually be a bit complex. So as long as you understand what we went through in the previous slide, you basically will be set for this course with regard to the humoral and the cellular reactions. So again, when you look at a figure like this, keep in mind the first thing that has to happen is antigen presentation. So that would be, for instance, in this slide here, that guy there is one of the APCs holding out its little hand, the MHC complex, to give the T cell a look at that antigen. To say, hey, this is the bad guy. The helper T cells will then do two things. For the humoral side, they will activate the B cells to turn them, so activate the B cells to turn them into plasma cells to produce antibodies. 
And on the cellular side, the helper T cells will activate cytotoxic cells to then destroy and lyse pathogen cells as well as infected host cells. Notice that some of the cells will become memory cells at the end so that next time this pathogen is encountered, the reaction will be a lot quicker. And then one final note is to always remember that regulatory T cells clean up the mess at the end. Now, when we talk about immunity, there is a few different aspects of adaptive immunity that you should understand. Adaptive immunity can either be naturally obtained or artificially obtained. And then furthermore, it can either be actively gained or passively gained. Okay, so the trick to distinguishing between these two categories of adaptive immunity is, first off, ask yourself, did you obtain that immunity from a doctor or was no doctor involved, okay? So if we look at the first type of immunity, naturally acquired adaptive immunity, for that, I want you to make note that there's no doctor, no shots. It's all natural. Whereas artificially acquired, you should see a doctor or some sort of shots, okay? So natural, no doctor, artificial, you're going to a doctor and getting shots. Then you can break down, down both of those categories into active or passive. So whenever you hear that something's active, what does that mean? If you're active, you have a lot of energy, right? And you're using a lot of energy, you're doing things. So in active immunity, your body is active. It's doing things, meaning it's making antibodies from being presented antigens. Whereas passive, if something's passive, doesn't require any work, no energy, nice and chill. So passive means that you're getting already made antibodies. Your body doesn't have to do any extra work, okay? There's no active nature to it. So you should be able to hear a scenario and basically figure out, is it natural or artificial or on top of that, is it active or passive? Okay, so for instance, if I gave any of the four scenarios that you see on this slide, if I said that, let's see, an antigen is introduced by going to the doctor's office, getting a vaccine, and then your body has to produce antibodies for that. Well, in that first part of what I said, I said you're going to a doctor's office, you're getting vaccines. Well, that means it's artificial, right? Because there's a doctor involved. I then said that your body is producing antibodies because in that vaccine, there would be antigens. So if your body has to actively work to produce antibodies, then boom, it would be active immunity, specifically active artificially acquired because it involved a doctor or vaccines and it involved the body doing work, okay? If we then go in order of the other ones, well, the first one that you see all the way on the left here, naturally active, because in this scenario, antigens enter the body naturally. So for instance, you're sitting on you know, the bus, someone nearby you sneezes, you breathe in their pathogens, okay? Once your body detects those antigens, it then induces the body to make a whole bunch of antibodies. Since you didn't go to a doctor and get a shot, it's naturally acquired. And since your body is doing things, producing antibodies, it's active. Whereas if, however, antibodies are passed from a mother to a fetus during, for instance, breastfeeding, well, these are already made antibodies. The baby doesn't have to do any work. So that's passive. And the fact that it was from the mother and not having to go to a doctor's office, that's natural. We've already discussed this one here, active artificial. So the last one to mention is passive artificial, which would be if you got an injection that had already made antibodies. So your body does not have to do anything extra to make the antibodies, you're already given antibodies. The problem with those kinds of shots is that they're usually shorter lasting 
and require you to get multiple boosters afterwards. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with if I give you a scenario, you should be able to identify whether it's naturally active, naturally passive, artificially active, or artificially passive. Now, throughout this lecture, we keep mentioning antibodies. And so this slide is just to give you a little idea of how exactly antibodies help with your immune system. The first one you see here is antibodies can work by what's called neutralization. So here you see the antibodies completely coat the pathogen. So that pathogen can no longer adhere or stay in the body or the tissues that it wants to. Okay, so by coating or neutralizing that pathogen, the pathogen can't attach and do damage. Agglutination, you've heard this term before, but in a different sense. Agglutination is any time you see clumping. In this case, what the antibodies do is it clumps together a whole bunch of the pathogens so that once again, just like in the first figure, the pathogens can't do their dirty work. Okay. The next one is opsonization, and in this one, pathogens are bound by antibodies that, are, that make them more efficiently engulfed by phagocytes. So basically, by having the antibodies coating the pathogen, it makes it more likely that a macrophage will detect them and engulf them and eat them up. The next one here is the complement activation. And remember, whenever you hear complements in microbiology, think to yourself, it's not as nice as it sounds. It basically means that the antibodies help activate the proteins that will then drill holes in the pathogen. Lastly, you have enhanced natural killer cell activation. Okay, so similar to what we said about the macrophages, by having the antibodies present, it helps enhance natural killer cell activities and allows them to better identify which cells they should be lysing and destroying. Okay, so these are all various ways to see that pathogens can help encourage the destruction of pathogens or at least block the pathogen from doing what it would want to do to harm your body. Here we just have a recap to let you visualize some of the things we talked about today in innate versus adaptive immunity. And you'll notice on the bottom here, it shows the difference in time for the uh, immunity to take place. So notice that innate immunity is very quick. Start of the infection, it really just tries to block or destroy anything whereas adaptive immunity takes more time to respond because it has to go through all those presentations of antigens. It has to go through various activations, differentiations, a whole lot of extra steps. Okay, so adaptive immunity will be a slower curve. This is one, this is one other slide to help you visualize all of the key players in terms of innate and adaptive immunity. So you see the various cells that we talked about and some of the pathways that they take to help protect you. Now, the last thing I wanna cover in terms of immunity today is the fact that thanks to the immune system and these various forms of immunity, specifically adaptive immunity, you don't have to treat some infections because you can prevent them first. And by preventing them first, we mean the idea of vaccinations. Okay, and again, this is thanks to adaptive immunity and the production of memory cells. So when you look at this slide in terms of vaccines, right now vaccines are a very hot topic, uh, especially news, media. There's a lot of controversy with regards to them. And so there are a few things that I wanna point out to you. First off is the concept of herd immunity, which I have here in all of these different figures. Herd immunity shows you that the more people who are vaccinated in a population, the more protected that overall population is. Because think about it, the more people who are vaccinated, the less spread that that pathogen can do. 
Okay, so it helps protect the people in the population who cannot get vaccinated. And if you're wondering who are these people that can't get vaccinated, well, very, very young babies, so babies under the age of six months, okay, and anyone who's immunocompromised. So there are certain people who, due to their medical problems, are unable to get vaccinated. And so all of these people who are refusing to get vaccinated, even though they can, they're now putting those people at risk. They're putting the immunocompromised at risk and the babies who cannot get vaccinated. Now you may say, well, maybe they're, you know, trying to protect themselves. Maybe that they think vaccines are dangerous. Well, that's BS. Vaccines are not dangerous. And if they understood what's truly in a vaccine or how vaccines worked, then they would understand why vaccines are safe. So when we say, why are vaccines safe? There's a few things. First of all, the vaccine never contains the full pathogenic microbe, okay? You will never have a fully active, dangerous organism in that vaccine. In fact, most of the vaccines that you are given are just a little piece of protein, right? They're a little piece of protein from that pathogen, okay? And that's all you need, right? Because you saw in immunity, all you need is the antigen, a little piece of protein to tell the the helper T cells to start activating all the cells. Okay, so most of the time, all you're getting is a little piece of protein. And ask yourself, well, this is the same thing if you encounter this out in the world, right? If you're sitting on a bus and you breathe in that antigen, okay? And so for instance, people try and say vaccines kill people or they cause things like autism. Well, think about it. If the vaccine was causing autism, wouldn't every single person who ever got sick from that pathogen in the real world, would, wouldn't they have autism too? Because it's the same thing. You're taking in that exact antigen and producing the immunity to it. Okay, so in fact, I have a, a good friend who happened to be one of my professors once. She, her, her younger sibling had autism and she explained to me how upset and how hurtful her and her family and other members of the autism community find the anti-vaxxers. They find that the, the people of the autism community actually find the anti-vaxxers to be very hurtful and offensive because they're basically telling the world that you would rather your child die of things like polio or measles. You'd rather your child dead than, God forbid, risk becoming autistic. And they've even proven that the vaccines are not causing autism, but that's the message that these anti-vaxxers are giving. And like I said, not only are they putting their own children at risk because, you know, they think they know things because they want to on the internet, they didn't actually go to school for all of this, um, but they're basically not only putting their own children at risk, but through reducing herd immunity, they're now putting the rest of the population at risk the people who can't get vaccinated, who are immunocompromised or too young. Okay, so keep that in mind whenever you see things on the news about vaccinations and make sure that you, you really educate yourself in the area rather than ever believing just what, you know, someone on TV says. So now to give you an idea of some of the vaccines that you know, what exactly is in them and how they're protecting us. Like I said, you'll never have any vaccine with a 100% fully active pathogen in it. Some rarer vaccines will have what's called a live attenuated vaccine, which means that they have weakened the pathogen. So basically, picture they took the pathogen and they engineered it where they removed the harmful part of it. So for instance, they removed its ability to produce toxins, okay? So kind of pictured as they took a murderer and they chopped off his, you know, arms and legs and said, okay, here, sit in the room with him. Well, it's not like he'll do much damage to you now, okay? Now this will allow 
your body to closely mimic the actual infection and it will give a lifelong immunity with a whole lot of memory cells. Again, a lot of vaccines are not actually live attenuated. That's one option, but most of them are not that. Um, most of them are just the antigen, which we'll get to in a minute. The next one that you see here is inactivated killed vaccines. So these, they're not even putting anything living in the body. They're basically a dead microbe, okay? And these require more booster doses, but it induces immunity just the same. Now, the bulk of the vaccines that you get nowadays, especially when you're adults, um, basically all the ones that you would get as an adult, they're more what's called subunit vaccines. So you don't even have a whole virus or whole bacteria put into your body. Instead, you have a little piece of protein. So in the case of recombinant vaccines, you're basically given a small subunit that was made by genetic engineering in a lab. In virus-like particle vaccines, you're giving what looks to be like the viral protein, but you're not getting any of the DNA or RNA. And in toxoids, you're getting toxin proteins that have been inactivated, basically where you're just getting enough of the protein for your body to then produce the matching antibodies. Okay, but in all of these, it's basically just the idea of you only need the antigen. That way your antigen presenting cells can show T cells to make that full blown immune response. The last ones here are conjugated and nucleic acid vaccines. In conjugated vaccines, basically what happens is that they have taken or joined a poor antigen to a stronger antigen to elicit a stronger response. Okay, so you see this a lot in, in for instance, children vaccines. So basically, if they know that a particular antigen will only produce a very small immune reaction, they'll pair it with something that produces a bigger one. That way the child ends up with better immunity to both. There's also nucleic acid vaccines because again, a lot of what we talked about today is the idea that you just need a little piece of protein, right? An antigen to trigger the reaction. So sometimes they'll inject a small piece of DNA that will then produce the protein in your body so that your immune system can detect that antigen and produce that whole adaptive re reaction that we talked about a few slides ago. Okay, but again, in all of these, what you're seeing is you're not getting a whole living pathogenic organism shoved into you. Okay, so they are safe. Now, to wrap up the idea of vaccines, I just want to point out the only time that you know someone should worry about vaccinations is if, for instance, they're someone who ha has a, a tendency towards severe allergies from, let's say, fillers or components that might trigger a response. The other thing I want to point out is <laughs> a lot of people, even some of my own relatives, uh, they would get a vaccine and then a few days after it, they feel sick and they're like, oh, oh, the vaccine is no good. The vaccines make me feel sick. Vaccines are bad. They make people sick. Um, that's not true. So there's two reasons why sometimes after getting a vaccine, you'll get sick. One is think about where you go to get vaccinated. When you go to get vaccinated, you're going to a doctor's office or a pharmacy where a whole bunch of sick people go to get their medications. So when you go to these places, you're picking up whatever you've encountered there, okay? So you're breathing in and touching all these things where sick people are. So you tend to pick up, you know, a little cold from there and you think, oh, the vaccine made me sick. Nope, not the vaccine. The second thing is when you get a vaccine, what's it doing? It's triggering your immune response, right? Just like if you had gotten sick from, you know, breathing in, flu virus, for instance. So since you are getting 
an injection of antigens to trigger your immune response, sometimes you may mildly feel your immune system being activated. Because all of these slides we went through show the various things that happen as your immune system is building up defenses. So things like inflammation, okay, things like mild fever, that would be perfectly acceptable because your immune response is being activated, but you are not being harmed by a pathogen, okay? So just keep these in mind next time you think about vaccines. Now, that's it for today's lecture. So as always, feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns that you may have. Please use the Remind app or email. Thank you and have a great day.